Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Big Idea. Thank you so much for joining us. The US mission to ASEAN started this program because we know that Southeast Asia is filled with leaders, and those leaders can inspire us to do more and to be more. And I am your host today. I'm Jason Seymour. I'm the US spokesperson for our mission. And I have a very special guest today. His name is Gabriel Bionis, and he is very active in the Philippines, doing lots of projects. The US government has worked with him on all kinds of tasks and helped him, and he is a wonderful, wonderful partner of ours. So let's bring him in. Gab, welcome to the program. Hi, Jason. Happy to be here. Excellent. I'm so excited to talk to you today. And one of the things I want to talk to you right off the top is in reviewing all your materials, I can tell that you have a creative soul. You're a poet. There's a guitar in the background. So you like music. So there's a lot of artistry. So please tell us a little bit about your artistry and your background and how art plays a role in your life. Okay, uh, just to be clear, I'm not as artistic as you're trying to portray it to be, okay? <laughs> but I'm, oh, I'm, I'm super like elated. <laughs> okay, I'm super elated. Um, I just happen to be someone who actually likes to write. Uh, I, I grew up writing. I, I think a lot of my uh, a couple of my siblings are writers in their on the publications, and we grew up writing together. You know, we you know writing music, writing songs, and I think my brother at one point also was into music a lot. And, you know, growing up, I think I've adopted that from my siblings. And then we pursued writing. But more than that, we've also adopted a couple of other skills. So I've been learning how to play guitar and to just really sing my heart out to my go-to karaoke songs, you know, just really getting into something that would actually distract me from the things that I'm particularly doing, you know. And I think it feeds my soul constantly. So that was a really something that... I, that's, you know, something to share. I, I think it was my first time to talk about that in my interviews. <laughs> so I surprised you. <laughs> yeah, I was a surprise. <laughs> now, I, I understand that you come, your, your background is Mindanao. And for our audience members who are not as familiar with the Philippines, uh, tell us a little bit about where you come from. And you're living in Manila, right? Uh, now, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So how did you end up becoming relocated to Manila. So uh, share a little bit about the uh, Filipino geography with our audience. Okay, so as you may know, the Philippines is a large archipelago. We have 7,100 islands. And I think Mindanao is one of the biggest, if not the biggest island in the Philippines. And um, it's in the south, southern region. And a lot of people in Manila, in Luzon, are actually coming from Mindanao. Mindanao is a... Uh, I would say it's a rising development and it's also been subject to a lot of social political issues. Um, we're talking about religious based conflicts, interracial conflicts, and then a couple of issues on bureaucracy and politics. But at the same time, development is welcome, especially with the past few years when um, the area has been getting a lot of traction and funding support from different agencies, including the US and Japan, uh, most importantly. So, you know, um, for the past few years, uh, there has been a lot of development framework that was actually put in into Mindanao. But it's a really great place to grow up, to grow up into. Like, um, I remember back then, you know, I never really imagined going outside Mindanao because um, when I was a child, I felt like the environment was complete. You know, I grew up in a very small rural area. Uh, it's a town somewhere in Bukidnon. So I was surrounded in a in a like a like a rural setting. Everyone was like um, just chill, and you know I'm um, going to the market on Sundays. Uh, quite of like a laid back lifestyle, but um, I've also realized that there's so much more to do in you know this professional world where I was trudging the social political my 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 professional journey. So I pursued a core a degree in chemical engineering, and that's. And I was able to actually go to the United States to get a certificate in new media journalism. So that sort of jump-started my interest into, you know, opened my eyes to the world and made me realize that there's so much more. And while I love Mindanao, 
you know, I kind of have to explore greener pastures. And that's when I moved to Manila because my siblings used to work here um, for, for call center agencies. And um, yeah, I was actually just re- tra- exploring the, my options here. And now I'm here talking to you. <laughs> Fantastic. And it's my pleasure. Now you were studying chemical engineering, but then you started to have an interest in journalism. So do you see the two is linked or, or how did that evolution occur? Okay, yeah. So I remember back then when I was actually in the States and we were studying new media and journalism, I was the odd one out because um, my, my classmates are pursuing anything that's directly related to journalism. They were, you know, mass communication, development communication students. And then there's just one student who's studying chemical engineering who happened to be in the group, um, going to the New York Times, going to Pennsylvania, you know, writing audio stories, writing podcasts, interviewing people, things that are not related to my course at all. But I've always wanted that kind of um, stamina or energy with media because I was the editor-in-chief of the publication, the spoof, the spoof one, and then the associate editor of the, uni- the university publication. So I was, I really have a background with, with journalism, but I kind of do this on the side, you know. But when I went to the States, I think it opened up a lot of, you know, it opened my eyes because we were already doing the live things. We were already hands-on with a camera. We were do- going to the TV channels. We were um, sort of like experimenting with our cameras and actually we're doing the newscasting. Uh, like it was my first time to do that um, as part of the classes that we've attended to and the hands-on experience. So that was so awesome. So I think that that, that sort of um, jump-started everything. I was sort of like thinking into, is this any, is this any at all related to chemical engineering? But um, I think there was a relevance to a certain extent because if you talk about chemical engineering, you have to you have to be big on uh, troubleshooting. You have to be big on problem solving. It's really about you know identifying what goes into a certain uh, what goes into a certain tank, what goes out, the entropy, the you know the amount of heat that goes in, and you know the amount of heat that was lost. You know you have to take into account everything else and the metrics. You have to be big on numbers as well. So like what I've said, aside from marketing, I also do media management. And in analytics, you have to be big on numbers. Uh, one small you know, um, misunderstanding or, uh, or discomfort with numbers will actually not make you a good marketer or digital media manager at all. So I think it was linked because you have to be comfortable with analytics and numbers. And um, I think that, you know, I also believe that chemical engineers have to also you know, um, understand how to problem solve on a bigger scale and not just on the plant setting. Also to like, you know, design thinking on the engineer, on the, on the, on the plants. You cannot just be super technical, but you have to always include the design thinking in there. How do you communicate that with the constituents, with the greater uh, decision makers of the company? I think that's where the cross section of engineering and marketing and media management uh, uh, lies. Yeah. I think you put that so well. And just to add an additional point, no matter what an individual studies, a lot of people go to university at 18, 19, 20, maybe they don't have a full sense of who they are or all their interests. So a lot of people study one thing in university. No one is stuck. We can all continue to evolve and grow in our adulthood and we can do a different career. But the key is what you were saying to take the things that we learn from no matter what we were doing before and integrate it into what we're doing now. And there's lots of possibilities yeah. there. I do super agree with that. You know, to, to the point that I actually developed a certain prototype for an app that mentors high school students to be able to have an advice on what course to take in college. And you know, that proposal that I actually, uh, you know, pitched to a certain hackathon, a national hackathon here in Manila, got me the first prize and the national hackathon. And um, that sort of like landed me the opportunity to go to Papua New Guinea and compete for the APEC app challenge, represent the Philippines. So I think that validates the need for a proposal or for an idea that really gets into, you know, mentoring younger people to properly take the, to properly choose the courses they're going to take into college. I think it's a, it's, it's good. It's a good thing that, 
we have a lot of freedom now to be more flexible in choosing the career paths that we do. But sometimes, you know, for certain people like me, I didn't have a lot of economic privilege before. So I needed to take that course because it was uh, due to the scholarship. I need to take a science and technology related uh, course because it was the scholarship related. So um, had it been like, you know, um, I kind of I kind of wish that more people, more young people will be given proper advice and options to be able to choose the courses they're going to take. It's timely, it's costly to choose the, ro- the wrong course. But yeah, um, <laughs> it's not never too late. <laughs> never too late. As you're mentoring young people or people of any age, what, what is something that you've learned about mentoring that has made you more effective as a mentor? What would you recommend to other people who, who want to be trainers, who want to focus on capacity development? What, do you have at least one tip that you could share with people who want to be better mentors? Yeah, um, I've, so I sort of work uh, on this plat. I've, I've had a partnership with a mentoring company in Canada and this is because I was a head of marketing of a brokerage in Canada. So I'm actually, there was one advice on mentoring and, you know, what actually, uh, on, that they actually gave. It was about uh, the ability to be creative, you know, to what do you do to think outside the box? Because I think a lot of us, we're doing things in an old school manner, which is, you um, we match people based on certain frameworks. We actually just do the what's been tested, but we never really think outside the box. It's like more of like seven out of 10. If you do the seven out of 10, it's, it's like covering the basics of what mentoring should be. But you know, what sets you apart as a mentor is if you think about um, how can you actually stand out from the crowd? Like, what do you do creatively to be able to get that person to really listen to you or to actually even acknowledge the value that you give to them? So I think that's a challenge because a lot of us say when there's a challenge and this person is not listening to me or didn't follow the advice, this person is stubborn. But, you know, it's a challenge to you. How can you be creative in your approach? Yeah, I think that's one thing, one advice to just share. That is the best way to look at it because every mentor has had the experience where a mentee seems to not want to listen or, or is not uh, willing to have conversations, not willing to engage. And to remember as a mentor to see that as a challenge rather than to give up on that person, just say, okay, how can I try something different in my mentoring? Uh, yeah, you have a lot of creative ideas. And I, I was particularly interested, I was reading one of the programs you did uh, which was a Wysili program, a U.S. government program, and that was the Break the Fake movement. So I have a couple of questions about this movement, but please just first tell our audience what this what this community improvement project was all about. Okay, so the Break the Fake movement started in 2017. It was actually a youth coalition of people, young professionals who are committed to fighting this information when it started, but it scaled up to promoting media literacy and awareness, media information and literacy, and promoting responsible digital citizenship. So our goal here is to democratize our ability to you know, promote responsible digital citizenship. But at the same time, the bigger goal here is to develop the next breed of media and information literacy champions all over the country. So that's the giant vision of Break the Fake Movement. Um, I think it started in a very humble beginning in 2017 when we were funded by, uh, by the U.S. Embassy. But I think, you know, um, I think where creativity entered was that how are we going to sustain the movement? And that is when we leveraged technology. We were so big on digital campaign planning, on hashtag campaigns, on pitching for ideas about the vlogging competitions, what's in, you know, we launched a vlogging competition, a blogging competition, a hackathon across Southeast Asia. And now we're doing a fact-checking mentorship webinar. Uh, we're doing a, a seminar workshop series and an online, we, lo- we just launched our online li- media literacy portal. So um, I think, a lot of these opportunities happened because of just one humble beginning. And that was just like 10 heads in one room thinking about how do you fight fake news? 
granting that you were interested about this issue. So yeah, the, um, you know, I'm probably the face of Break the Fake movement, but I just wanted to tell you, Jason, there are a lot of other people behind this movement and they're also equally worth celebrating. Any quality project is never about one person. It's always yeah. a coalition. That is absolutely true. Let me take a pause right now uh, and ask for collaborators with this conversation. So I am enjoying asking questions and listening to all these answers. But if you in the audience have a question to ask of Gab, please put it in the comments below and uh, we'll give uh, Gab an opportunity to address those questions. But I'll, I'll just continue on. So I'm curious what you think journalists are getting wrong now, because there is a lot of disinformation. Many journalists work very, very hard and they're very ethical about it. But a lot of journalists sometimes get caught up in sharing information that is wrong. Why do you think that's happening? And how do we address it? How do we change it? Okay, uh, the first thing I wanted to say is actually concession. Um, for those journalists who are doing it probably making mistakes, it's, it's normal, you know? Um, I always wanted to say this, the media is directly uh, working, or, or the premise of the work of the media is always on the public trust. If they lose the trust, they will never be able to operate. That's why they have the bigger incentive to do the right thing. But if ever they fail, it's not like we have to crucify them because the, it's their job, it's their job to make sure it's right Everything is based on veracity, but they can fail too on certain reports, on certain cases, because they're humans. That's why you have to make sure. But you know, media entities can actually apologize. They correct. It's a self-checking entity. You know, the media institution, the media landscape, it's a self-checking landscape. So if one media entity or media platform will actually go wrong with a certain report, the other media platform can immediately correct it. It's self-corrective. That's the beauty of media. So I think, number one, it's wrong to crucify journalists who probably on certain occasions will get wrong with their reports. But secondly, and I think this is where um, journalists have to really embody and embrace the job. It is your job as a journalist to make sure that the information you're conveying is particularly truthful because you're not a normal citizen. You are a source of information to begin with. As a matter of fact, you probably are considered an influencer in your certain niche. So it is you have a high, you are on a higher pedestal with a higher responsibility to be able to cross-check information, fact-check everything that you actually share. Thirdly is um, you have to actually go the extra mile. And I'm, by extra mile, what I'm saying is that you do not just simply do the job, report. You have to do investigative journalism, the investigative uh, reporting. If you needed to be able to get support on that, on that matter, do that. Because, you know, uh, it's not enough that you actually just do your job and, you know, hide in the cloak and, like, um, probably just wrap things up and go home. A lot of journalists... If you really embody your job, you really have to do investigative journalism. That's the only way for us to actually get through this tunnel of dark times. A lot of things are happening. It's so crazy. Sometimes you get red tagged for do you, you know, espousing the truth in the open. But that's your job. And uh, you have to be able to rally for support to be able to get, that, uh, get those things done. You are the perfect entity to actually do that um, because we're not investigative journalists. But if you are... You just, you just need support to be, to be enabled and you are the best entity to be able to rally for that. Yeah, that's my three-prong advice for journalists. <laughs> Excellent advice. Now, it's also interesting to me, a number, so the US government has this network called the Waisili Networks, Young Southeast Asian Leadership Initiative. And a lot of people join our network. So we hear a lot of different things from different people. Some people, they want to do journalism, but they are inspired by some of the US platforms in which journalists have become advocacy journalists. So you have your traditional journalist who attempts to be neutral and just reports the news. And then you have other journalists who advocate, they take a certain position and then they try to present the facts that support that position. 
What are you seeing in terms of the media landscape in Southeast Asia or the Philippines? What are you seeing at, at the, the trends right now? Is it following the US model or, or starting to, or is it maintaining a sort of a traditional perspective? Um, yeah, so the first that I've really noticed is that there's a rising traditional loss, loss of trust in traditional media. Um, I think that's the reason why primarily a lot of uh, consumers of information are shifting to alternative media sources like social media. And because of this distrust to traditional media models, uh, you know, Jason, what's weird, and this is a rising trend in Southeast Asia, is that even influencers, like micro-influencers, are primary sources of information now. So they tend to believe on a micro-influencer rather than uh, those peer-reviewed and media-sanctioned entities and platforms. So um, we are actually seeing a dynamic change in the landscape, I would say, because now a lot of the media consumption and decision making by people are in social media and it's what's worse is that it's actually uh, influencer led you know and the problem with that is uh, it's not necessarily cross checked or peer reviewed so that's one harm um i would say the other trend that i have that we are seeing here in the in the southeast asian region sphere is the collaborations between publishers and social media companies. And I think um, way before, social media companies are actually not taking this issue seriously, but they've taken a stance, you know, they are slowly collaborating with different uh, fact-checking organizations. As a matter of fact, um, I'm not going to say this is a welcome development, but in Australia, for example, there was a collaboration between pu uh, the publishers and social media companies are now starting uh, to discuss about what goes to your social media feed and whatnot. You know, so you're not necessarily going to see um, articles from the Australian Financial Review in your newsfeed. So um, there is a conversation between publishers and social media companies. And I think that's important because that sort of like uh, just jump started the conversation rolling because I would want to see more transparency and activity from technology companies. And in the Southeast Asian sphere, there was a lot of activity from Facebook already. As a matter of fact, they actually support media education efforts in the Philippines. And they, they actually supported one of the programs that we have in Break the Fake Movement. So that manifests the, their commitment to promote media literacy education. They probably will protect a certain level of business interest just because they are advertisers. Um, but I would want to see more like, you know, being more transparent about the advertisers, the, the people behind the campaigns and things like that. But uh, in terms of trends, I think this is a welcome development. Yeah, I, I would want to go to jump to the media part, but I'm, I think I'm consuming a lot of time. So that's, that's, that's enough good. for now. This is a topic of great interest to people. It certainly is to me. I'll ask you one more question about the media and then we'll talk a, a, about a different topic. This is a question from Tran Ho. And Tran Ho is asking something or is observing something that a lot of people observed. And that is that there was a tense relationship between the press and the former US President Trump. So there was a lot of questioning about whether he was providing uh, disinformation or information. There was a constant back and forth and fact checking, as you mentioned. And how do you, what is your feeling about the appropriate role for the interactions of journalists? and political figures. You do a lot of advising of young people and journalists and inspiring them. How far do you think they should push and what should they do? Because we both know in some Southeast Asian countries, if journalists push too far, they risk being imprisoned. So what do you advise to people? Um, number one, if it's an advice to journalists or in the media field, I always say protect your interest, okay? Um, to be honest with you, Jason, I do not necessarily make super controversial or critical pronouncements in Facebook or in my social media accounts precisely only because I'm protecting our programs, the media literacy and education programs that we have in Break the Fake Movement. It's very important that you know the zones, your your, the zones you're protecting here, okay? So you need to be able to identify them because 
if you're going to be so aggressive, I know we have you have your point, you have your own, you know, inner fire within you, but you have interests to protect, and it's it probably will be will pose a backlash if you're going to be so aggressive. So number one, you have to identify your zones, your the zones, and how you're going to protect them, and how you're going to actually speak in a language that you can still rally for the advocacies and causes you're fighting for without necessarily losing support on the programs that you're trying to protect. So that's number one. Or so if you're a journalist, you have to always be um, in, the, in the side of like assessing whether um, am I going to lose public trust if I'm going to expose this or I'm probably going to say these things, you know? So that's one thing to consider. But if you can afford, you know, given like, you know, that w- one thing I also wanted to say is that there are clearly um, unrelative uh, ideas that are just morally, I mean, that are, you know, what I mean to say is that there are things that are not relative at all. Like it's just morally unacceptable. Like for example, if it's, uh, if it's, un- it's completely unacceptable to promote chaos in social media. Okay, that's number one. That's why technology companies will have to shut you down if you have to make pronouncements that, you know, um, rally somewhere because we, we have to fight for our rights. That's particularly vi- uh, promotion of violence and that's violation of community standards. So social media companies have to be able to um, fight back and say, we're going to shut down your accounts. But if you are like a journalist, I think the, the advice that I really have is that number one, audit your comfort zones and make sure that you are protecting your interest because you can't possibly protect the interest of majority if you're not protecting or sustaining your own self to begin with. And then number two, use your voice for your own good, for the good of the majority. And it's very important that at the end of the day, even if you rallied your support on a certain um, advocacy or like uh, probably a uh, you know, an, act, an activism agenda, you still, you still have that public trust because you are a conveyor of information. So, Credibility is essential, no matter yeah. what. Um, I, I've, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to actually say that I remember, I just remembered this quote, your reputation is your most important currency. And I like that uh, in particular. I, That is perfect, yes. Credibility, reputation, your values, all those things come across, whatever you're doing online. And that brings me to a slightly different topic. You're also passionate about enabling or providing spaces or expanding spaces for individuals from marginalized communities. And I'm wondering what we can do, what you've done, what we can do, to make sure that we're that that more and more voices are finding a place in the all these online platforms that we have now. Yeah, um, you know, I think the we are all rushing to the fourth industrial revolution. There was a massive shift towards digital, and I think on the process in our journey to you know in our effort to rush towards it. A couple of certain parties are left behind. And I think we're talking about people from the countryside, people who are PWDs, people who are, you know, who, do, who are not social media savvy and probably are not able to arrive to proper decision making because they just didn't have that proper, you know, tools and platforms. So number one, I wanted to set the tone that a lot of people are actually left behind and this digital economy isn't really that inclusive at all. But um, there are a lot of efforts, um, I would say, from the government. They just needed to be mainstream. So um, right now, you know, for the past three years, uh, the government, the Philippine government, I would say, has a partnership with my agency. Um, and not just my agency, a lot of um, other consultants also. They launched this program that enables people who were displaced by the economy to have an online job, you know, or freelancing careers. So they could actually be matched with certain um, clients from overseas. What the government does is that they provide trainings and then they, they, they get consultants through digital marketing agencies like ours. And then we provide the training 
And then we on- onboard people from the countryside to be part of the digital economy. So we have actually been helping a lot of people uh, like PWDs who are now graphic artists for companies in the U.S., you know, former fishermen, for example, who do not know how to touch a computer to begin with or like how to encode in a computer are now, you know, being able to actually do basic work like data encoding. So that's uh, that's a super uh, welcome efforts coming from the government, I would say. And it's also a great private-public partnership efforts. So um, that's one thing uh, the my, my agency has partnered with the government alongside with many other consultants and agencies that working with the government to mainstream these kinds of efforts. Another thing, we are also uh, doing a lot of uh, work on creating mobile apps and that, you know, uh, just mainstream the conversation about uh, digital economy, more of like, for example, my, my company was working on this app on... Um, a job matching platform for people with autism. So uh, I, I know that a lot of people who are uh, who have autism are left behind because the moment they actually see this person, uh, they were automatically, you know, uh, rejected by the HR because of their disability or like or not being able to, you know, um, perform properly co- in comparison with the other applicants. But they deserve equal chances too. So what my what the platform I'm building is, you know, um, a job matching platform that acknowledges that people with autism are actually very st- uh, strong when it comes to uh, brain, uh, with, when it comes to processing data, you know, they actually have uh, new, new, neural knowledge. And it's a rising trend in the West that they're actually investing on people with autism to actually look into AI, uh, AI, AI skills, you know? So those things are not being adopted that much and not being mainstream too much in Southeast Asia, but these are rising trends in the West. And should the government or other partners actually support efforts like this, we can make our efforts for digital economy more inclusive, I would say. And the, this is just one parallel model, Jason, uh, the efforts that we do for this, for the PWD, uh, people with autism, uh, people who are left behind in the countryside. But I think and I believe that uh, the government should always take the extra mile to make our efforts towards the fourth industrial revolution more inclusive. Absolutely. Giving opportunities to people who haven't had opportunities before, that is the beauty of some of these programs. And I, I want to encourage anyone who's listening to this show to be on the lookout for opportunities from the U.S. mission and other mission U.S. missions throughout Southeast Asia because we constantly have grants programs and partnerships that we want to create, that we've created with you, because I know that you've been part of multiple U.S. programs and received money from us for various programs. Now, you went to the United States on a program we called SUSI. I'm just wondering, where did you get to visit when you were in the United States? So in 2011, I went to Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. So we went there for two months. And then after that, I remember we were living on a bus for like two weeks, maybe, and then traveling through the East Coast. So we went to Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, uh, Brooklyn and New York, and then uh, Washington, D.C. and West Virginia. So, yeah, that, that, that sort of journey, we Grudge that, and we were able to visit a lot of places like um, TV stations <laughs> mostly, and then New York Times, you know, um, Times Square, a lot of media, media related films and channels. But it was super fun. I, I love it. I love the experience. I hope you weren't sleeping on the bus every night. I hope they put you in some <laughs> motels as well. <laughs> we did some couple of breaks on certain days, but there were really our days that we really had to sleep in a bus. But we were college back then, so we're not like okay. super, you know, asking for good hotel experience. I mean, for the opportunity to see all those places and travel and get to know the United States, it's worth it. So if you could return to the United States in 2022, what, what city would be on your list? Um, I really wanted to go to, you know, number one, I really want to go back to New York. That's one, because... When I went to New York, I, know, I, I'm, I don't really know a lot about it. Like my classmates were pointing to Juilliard. We were passing through Juilliard School 
and they said, oh, that's Juilliard School. And I know, don't even know what Juilliard School is. You know, I was not, because Netflix was not popular back then. But now it's mainstream that I've watched a lot of Western shows. And I think um, I really want to go back to New York, number one. Um, I want to go to Colombia <laughs> to begin. Like probably this is the only thing I have in mind. I want to go to Colombia Business School and, um, you know, very academic. I, I, I say Harvard too. I want to go to Harvard. But yeah, those are just the, the probably the Ivy League schools. Not so interested with the other places, me, you know. Well, we'll, we'll, sometime we'll have a longer chat and I'll convince you to go to Northern California, where I'm from. That's why the Golden Gate Bridge is in the background. Oh, yeah, you have an awesome. Maybe I'll convince you. Uh, But if in 2022, uh, COVID is is, uh, not quite as significant, we all hope and pray, uh, but hopefully that changes. And I'm able to visit the Philippines. Uh, where should I visit in your beautiful country? Um, if you ever come here, and you are so, so welcome here, um, I would suggest Boracay. It's my happy place. I really love Boracay that much. Um, I would say probably Baguio. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but Baguio is like a, uh, a vacation place, summer capital, but it's also in a, an uphill land. Uh, it's a hill, but it, it's a city and a hill, you know, it's super uh, interesting, uh, probably the coolest, the coldest place in the Philippines. So those two I would recommend. And if you're into surfing, which I don't know if you are, you're probably going to go to Shargao. Um, I'll give you a list if ever you will. <laughs> yeah. And if ever I'm still here. <laughs> Oh, well, that will definitely happen. And uh, when, I, when I go to the Philippines, I will uh, contact you and you'll, you'll, you'll let me know and I, I'll make sure that I know all those places. I'll be your tour guide. Excellent, excellent. And just for some of our people, our audience members who, who, who don't know that much about Filipino culture, what is one of your favorite Filipino holidays that I should know about? A good time of year when I should visit your country. Um, I think the best is summer, which is mm-hmm. summer. It's summertime now, right? But I know because it's COVID. But you know, um, Jason, if ever you consider, you have to come here around April or or May. It's I think it's perfect because we have a lot of beautiful beaches here. If you actually watch or read, uh, travel magazines, our beaches are one of the best in the whole world. So we have white beaches and. We also have the richest marine biodiversity here in the Philippines. It's a coral triangle. So it's a lot, if you're into diving, you would know that. There's a lot of, uh, um, a lot of awesome spots for diving also. So summer would be the best uh, months to actually do that. While we, while, we, while we were chatting just a moment ago, I, I made the mistake, or maybe it was a good thing, and I noticed the clock. And wow, this uh, our time has just gone by so quickly. <laughs> We've talked about yeah. so much, but I do want to ask you one last question. I was reading you. You have a website in which you put some poems, some very thought-provoking poems, and you had one line which I want to share with the audience, and I would uh, like you to add a comment. And you say, you lose the courage to say no. I thought that was such a creative line. I don't know if you remember that line. It might've been a while ago when you wrote that poem, but please share it with, with our audience. If you remember what message you were trying to convey when you said you lose the courage to say no. Okay, um, to be honest with you, I'm not going to fake it. I completely forgot. Oh. <laughs> context <laughs> completely <laughs> forgot the context you know um i would actually say i do share a lot of thoughts in my twitter and my poems website but it's super based on the circumstance and the current context that i'm experiencing uh-huh. but if that was the case um uh, i'm probably saying something like uh there are certain times oh you know i'm just guessing okay uh, i'm just guessing um I'm, it's probably about um you know there are certain times that are outside my control or outside your control and you have to be able to still get the resolve to continue. I think it's about resilience. Um, It's kind of weird also, right? Like why would I actually say 
why would I actually say something about losing the courage to say no? I wanted to like get the entire picture of that. Now my our audience probably would probably dig into the entire context because I also <laughs> lost the context. But um, yeah, probably about courage and fighting for, you know, yeah, uh, fighting were, for. I think you were flipping the way that people normally think about the concept, and so you were creatively looking at the way that, um, you know, as you. As you expand yourself, as you mature, you take more chances. And that is a good thing. So sometimes we get to our adolescence and, and um, we, you know, we get to our early adulthood and we say no a little too often. And we think that's the brave thing to do to stand out from the crowd. But actually you should take chances, you should push yourself, you should, uh, you should expand. Perhaps that's what you meant. Maybe not. <laughs> we'll have to go back and look. You know, you know, one, thing really, one thing I I'm really so embarrassed about. already. I'm so embarrassed. I, you ended up explaining the poem that I wrote. <laughs> I think that's what you meant. I admire your humility. It's true. You you have big thoughts. You're a big thinker. You have lots of ideas. You've turned lots of big ideas into realities. And you can't keep track of it all because you're constantly doing, doing, doing <laughs> new ideas. And, yeah. and that is what I admire about you so much. So we're going to have to wrap up the interview because we've gone so long. Really, really enjoyed talking to you uh, about media literacy and the many projects you've done. There's so much more to learn about you and to be inspired by you because you, you really have done a lot for the community on a... Uh, a Southeast Asian scale, on a Filipino scale. I admire what you do. Keep up the good work. We'll continue. The US government and you and all the people who collaborate with you. This is a, a journey, a partnership. Let's keep doing it together. Thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks to our audience for joining us. So we'll say goodbye for now. Until our next show, thanks to God, thanks to our audience. <laughs>